I'm sorry? I would like to entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the March 14th, 2016 minutes. On a motion by Vice Mayor McGovern, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? The ayes have it, and the minutes are a part of the now official part of the record. We now move to public comment. Public comment is that part of the agenda where anyone can speak on any item on the agenda except communications. The communication list is not something that you can speak on. Um, and so we will begin that shortly. I just want to remind people that anyone can speak on any item. Um, if you're signed up, I, um, if, if you haven't put what the item is that you're speaking to, uh, just please uh, mention that. We speak uh, the public comment part, portion per individual is three minutes. We really try to keep to that because we want to be fair to everyone. So we really do strictly adhere to the three-minute rule. I'm glad that you're here, and I thank you for in advance for your participation. Our first person that signed up to speak is Manny Lusado, followed by Professor Max Penmark. Pegmark. Pegmark. Thank you, Mayor Simmons. My name is Manny Lissardi. I live at 15 Lambert Street, and I'm here to comment on policy order number seven regarding appointing an immigrant representative to the Cambridge City Council. As many of you know, I am a first-generation American. My father came here to this country from Italy during World War I, escaping war-torn Europe at the age of 12. In addition to seeking refuge, he also came to America to pursue his own hopes and dreams, no different than immigrants today who are coming to America from all over the world, including those escaping civil war in Syria. An important founding principle that helped spark the, the birth of our nation is no taxation without representation. Yet thousands of immigrants or non-citizen Cambridge residents who pay taxes, contribute to our economy, or have children who attend our schools cannot take part in voting for our city council or our school committee members. Cambridge has historically been a, nas a national leader in protecting immigrants or non-citizens living on U.S. soil. In fact, it was one of the first to designate itself its sanctuary city for Cambridge, for Cambridge residents for immigrant Cambridge residents, a decision that was not popular at the time, but an act that I am very proud of. Giving immigrants or non-citizens non -citizens a non-voting representative that will only advise the city council will give a voice to a large part of the Cambridge residents that is sadly underrepresented in our city. Many Americans take their civil, civil, uh, civic duties for granted as proven by how few Americans vote. Allowing this immigrant representative an opportunity to represent all immigrants or non-citizens throughout Cambridge will have tremendous civic value as a training ground for those for the responsibilities of citizenship. Because this representative will be voted for solely by immigrant or non-citizen Cambridge residents. The current atmosphere in our national political arena is legitimately frightening. Right-wing political frontrunners are speaking to thousands upon thousands of their supporters at huge rallies calling for millions of undocumented immigrants or non-citizen Americans to be forcibly removed from their homes and deported. Cambridge needs to act now to protect the undocumented immigrants or non-citizen population in our city that once again are being forced back into the shadows, treated like common criminals solely because they have hopes and dreams no different from what my father had 100 years ago. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Lasadi. Leave your comments in the basket. Thank you so much. Uh, please, I, I want to ask that we not uh, clap or cheer. And the reason why is sometimes for people that may be on the opposite end of the issue, it may make them intimidated. So it's really a courtesy. And, and I really thank you for uh, adhering to that rule. Uh, we're going to next have Professor Max Pegmark, followed by Lucas Perry. Thank you, Mayor Simmons. So I'm a professor just down the road here at uh, MIT in physics. And uh, for the 14 years that I've been here in Cambridge, I felt like a moocher, really enjoying the privileges of working in this great city without ever really giving anything back to it. So tonight is my chance to hopefully contribute something useful. T together, this is regarding item one on the agenda for the nuclear divest divestment. So together with Abel Corver at Harvard and Lucas Perry at Boston College, we prepared this roughly 200-page long report 
with all the financial details that are sort of relevant for this. And I'm going to put this long report here in the, the box. We also have a short version and enough for each councillor and all of you. I'm going to look at the, at the charts there later on in the evening's deliberations. And to summarize what this shows is simply that it's if you decide to vote yes to this and divest your fiscal hassles for the, for the pension fund. And moreover, there are even mutual funds, quite a large number of, of socially responsible mutual funds that already have excluded nuclear weapons production. And you'll find in this report a convenient summary of all of them. So we hope that this will be useful material when you make this decision. And I just want to volunteer also that um, if, if there are further questions later, also after this meeting, where further re research from our teams at MIT and Harvard and BC can help, we'll be most delighted to do so. Uh, I finally just want to add that I think this is a great... Um, I'm delighted that you're taking up this motion. I think it's a very, very good idea, and I, I fully support it. And I think that if the city of Cambridge votes yes on this, what will eventually happen is that a large number of other municipalities across the U.S., a lot of individuals, a lot of universities will do the same. And Cambridge will be the leader of this. Cambridge will be the first in the U.S. to do this. So this policy order will be a role model for many, many other policy orders, and it will be very, very inspirational also for college students and activists across the country to say, look, people said you couldn't do this, but Cambridge showed us not only you can do it, but how to do it, and let, let's follow this lead. So... I'm crossing my fingers. This is what's going to happen. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony and the work that you've done. Lucas Perry followed by Victoria Krakovna. Hello, my name is Lucas Perry. I'm here from Boston College. And I'd just like to give a little bit more context to this uh, nuclear resolution that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, you know, it's 2016, and we often aren't really thinking about nuclear weapons anymore. Uh, we feel that the Cold War is over, but they're very much still a problem. See, one of my favorite people, Carl Sagan, once said that it is clear that the nations of the world now can only rise and fall together. It is not a question of one nation winning at the expense of another. We must all help one another, or we will all perish together. See, with nuclear weapons, there can be no winner. We either disarm, dismantle, and divest, or we risk perishing together. Yet, we all might understand this paradigm, but, but Cambridge is currently investing in these weapons at the expense of us all. Today, this planet has roughly 15,700 nuclear warheads. If only 100 of these were to go off, billions would die in the first month. Cambridge is participating in the most objective and concrete way to destabilizing the world and creating a future of nuclear winter and holocaust. Tonight, we have a chance to rectify this, but we must not succumb to a diffusion of responsibility. I hope that tonight the city of Cambridge will reflect this wisdom and see its position and responsibility in co-creating the world of tomorrow. And I hope that world is a nuclear-free one. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. My name is uh, Victoria Krakovna, and I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard University, and I would like to very much support the proposal to divest from nuclear weapons, and uh, I feel very inspired that the city of Cambridge is considering this bold move to step towards a more uh, nuclear-free world, and I think that uh, divestment from nuclear weapons will help uh, make the whole, whole world safer and also uh, direct uh, these funds uh, to much more socially responsible causes. Um, and uh, the U.S. already has a lot of nuclear weapons, much more than is, could reasonably be needed for deterrence. Um, and so it is a very reasonable step to divest from nuclear weapons and uh, direct these funds elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Joseph Gerson, followed by Elaine Scary. Um, 
My name is uh, Joseph Gerson. I'm the Director of Programs of the American Friends Service Committee, uh, which has worked for justice and peace here in, uh, based here in Cambridge since the late 1920s. I stand in support of resolution number one. Uh, since shortly after the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, AFSC has called for and worked for the abolition of nuclear weapons. We've worked closely with nuclear weapons victims, those in Japan, downwinders, miners, and atomic veterans here in the United States, and those in other nations. Their very clear message is that nuclear weapons and humans cannot coexist. This understanding was part of the Cambridge City Council's early support for the nuclear weapons freeze, its, distrib its distribution to every household in the city of the No Place to Hide uh, booklet, uh, and its uh, joining Mayors for Peace. We have long known that a major nuclear weapons exchange would result in nuclear winter and the end of all life as we know it. More recent studies, which I have here, uh, demonstrate that if as, as few as 50 to 100 of the world's nearly 16,000 nuclear weapons were detonated over cities, the resulting fires and smoke would lead to global uh, cooling and the deaths of as many as 2 billion people in the Northern Hemisphere. The International Commission of the Red Cross reports that neither it nor any other institution has the resources to meaningfully respond to the massive death and destruction of even a single nuclear warhead being detonated in urban areas. Eric Schlosser has testified at the International Governmental uh, Humanitarian Consequences of Nuclear Weapons Conferences that there have been so many nuclear weapons accidents and miscalculations that humanity survives today as a result of luck rather than policy. For example, a drop wrench in an ICBM silo igniting a fire and literally launching a, a warhead. Flocks of geese have been mistaken for incoming missiles. Orders to launch nuclear weapons have been mistakenly made. Back in 1983, it was the history of the Navy's nuclear weapons accidents that played a determinative role in the city of Boston, refusing to endorse proposals to turn Boston Harbor into a nuclear weapons base. Yet the United States nuclear arsenal includes more than 7,000 of these apocalyptic weapons, and the U.S. military industrial complex is in the process of spending $1 trillion of our tax dollars to create a new generation of nuclear weapons and their delivery systems with enormous, enormous super profits uh, for the few companies that are manufacturing them as they prepare for nuclear apocalypse. This money should be spent uh, actually for meeting essential human needs, from feeding and housing the hungry and homeless, to providing quality education uh, for all and investment in a 21st century infrastructure, including a revitalized MBTA, uh, in order to ensure economic opportunity and security for this and future generations. Friends, each of us, uh, each U.S. nuclear strategic warhead can kill more people than were exterminated at Auschwitz. By supporting and adopting the divestment resolution, Mr. we can Gerson. begin the process of ending our community's complicity in preparations for nuclear um, Thank you yeah. for your testimony. I'm at my That's end. your three minutes, and I really appreciate yes. your testimony. Elaine Scary, followed by Sylvia Del, Sylvia Del Marius. Oh, so, Elaine Scary. Elaine Scary, I live on Green Street in Cambridge and I'm the Cabot Professor of Aesthetics at Harvard. I'm here to thank you for considering the resolution to withdraw retirement money from the nuclear weapons industry and also to urge you to vote unanimously in favor of the policy order and resolution. A few days ago, you encouraged all of us to celebrate Earth Hour, where all of us enjoy the beauty of Earth, and yet our vast nuclear arsenal in the United States every hour of every day threatens the Earth. As both Lucas Perry and Joseph Gerson mentioned, if only 1% of the current arsenal, 1% of the current arsenal is used, 44 million people will die on the first afternoon and 1 billion in the first month. In addition to all the human beings, millions of animals, birds, plants will die. And of course, the surface of the earth and the air above the earth will be badly wounded. So I urge you to vote for this. The Non-Proliferation Treaty requires the nuclear states to disarm, and yet the nuclear states have not even yet had one group meeting to bring this reality about with the result that weapons are prol proliferating more and more. We're mystified by what the steps are that can begin to reverse this, but we think there's a real chance that if Cambridge acts tonight, 
and other cities take up the same call, that it may begin to convince the nuclear states to disarm. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Sylvia Del Damaris, Damaris, followed by Dave Slaney. Thank you, Mary Simmons and the rest of the City Council. My name is Sylvia Demeray, and I'm here today to speak on behalf... Bring your mic down closer to your mouth. Sure. My name is Sylvia Demeray, and I live at 39 Sherman Street here in Cambridge. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Policy Order Number 7. I'm a member of the Non-Citizen Advocacy Group here in Cambridge, and we're working out of Nadeem Azan's office to try and help create a a non-citizen representative through this policy. The main goal of this policy would be to create a direct advocate for the large proportion of Cambridge residents who are not yet naturalized. As many know, becoming a citizen is at times an extremely long process, and even the most knowledgeable and prompt immigrants can wait anywhere from 5 to 22 years. That's the most that I've seen so far, and waiting a long span of time is becoming more common. What is definite, though, is that non-citizens must pay state, local, and federal taxes no matter if they're residents or just citizens. And all the while, they have no one that is directly responsible for hearing their concerns and responding. Many efforts have been made by Cambridge to help our foreign-born residents, such as creating the community engagement team that helps connect all residents with local resources available to them. But we believe that with over a quarter of the population being foreign-born and just about two out of five of them having citizenship, that a more clear representative would be a way to unite these disenfranchised communities across our city and make all feel more welcome and more actively engaged Canterburgians. All residents have personal stakes in their communities. They care about safe neighborhoods. They care about fair employment practices and strong school programs. And as a city, we should work to engage all of our communities. This representative would not be able to vote as our nine city councilors would. They would not vote on city policies, but they would be welcomed as an advocate for the community of non-citizens that is ever present and ever growing in our city. A vote for residents is a voice. We believe that everyone in Cambridge deserves one, and this is a way of allowing more of our valued residents an opinion in city matters so that all perspectives may be heard. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Dave Slaney, followed by Leslie Cohen. Hi, my name is Dave Slaney. I'm a member of the uh, Cambridge Living Wage Advisory Board. Uh, I want to speak in support of order number two. Uh, I don't think there's much question but that there's an emerging national consensus that Wages below $15 an hour are simply not fair, especially in high-cost uh, areas like, like Cambridge. Uh, you can just look at last Saturday's globe if you want to see that. Uh, as you know, the, currently the minimum wage in Cambridge and in all of Massachusetts is $10 an hour. Uh, clearly the best solution would be for the council to pass a minimum wage for Cambridge of $15 an hour indexed to inflation. But as you all know, that doesn't seem to be a possibility because the state constitution seems to prohibit municipalities from setting their own minimum wages. There is a bill in the state house now, Senator Wolf has introduced a bill that would give municipalities that right, and I would hope that the council would endorse that bill and would uh, communicate with Cambridge representatives asking them to vote for it, and I would certainly hope that Councilor Toomey would do that. Um, And if that bill does not pass, which appears likely, then I would hope that the Cambridge City Council would look into the possibility of a home rule resolution to deal with this issue. But in the meantime, I think there are some things that the council and the city could be doing right now to address this issue. And I think one of the ways to do that is to look creatively at ways in which the, the, the coverage of the living wage ordinance can be expanded. Cambridge has a living wage ordinance adopted in 2001. The current rate is $15.04 an hour, indexed to inflation. It's a very good law, and it says that that's what a fair wage would be in Cambridge. The problem is that it only covers municipal employees and employees working on uh, grants or contracts with the city in excess of $10,000. So its reach is very small. One way to think about expanding the reach of the living wage ordinance would be to modify the, to revise the living wage ordinance so that its provisions would apply to any developer who was covered 
by the linkage requirements. Any developer currently required to make a payment into the Affordable Housing Fund would also be required to put an entitlement on their property, on their development, saying that anybody who rented or, le uh, or bought that property would agree that anybody working in or on it would be covered by the living wage ordinance. Now, this idea, which was actually endorsed, was one of the proposals that came out of the Income and Security Commission that Mark chaired uh, that met last year. And uh, the idea was then taken up by Councilor Simmons, Denise, who uh, there was a, a, um, a, a resolution last August calling on the city manager to uh, initiate a study of this Mr. idea Slaney? and to see its feasibility. Mr. Slaney, that's, that, that's your time. So that's what? my time? That's your time. Okay, I'm going to stop. stop there, but I hope that you'll Thank pursue you. this idea. Thank you so much. Leslie Cohen, followed by Mihaela Tegmark. Ms. Cohen. Hi, thank you. My name is Leslie Cohen. Um, I'm also here to support um, resolution number two, so I'll just um, pick up where Dave was saying. Um, last August, the city council, uh, the city manager was asked to look into uh, making a study of whether or not it's feasible to link the living wage ordinance with a, um, with a, a linkage ordinance, and um, we've heard nothing back about it. Um, and so this resolution is simply to ask the city manager to tell us what's happening with this study, to tell us what the next steps are. Um, I just want to say that uh, it, it is true. We all know that people can't live on $10 an hour, and um, $15 an hour seems like a minimum for people to be able to have any kind of decent life living in Cambridge or in the environs. And I feel like the wage differential in Cambridge is getting wider and wider. There are cities all around the country who have taken this up and done something to raise their living wage for many, many people in the city. And Cambridge hasn't yet done that. Um, like Dave said, the people covered by the living wage is a very narrow group of people uh, in Cambridge. So rather than leading on this, which I feel like we sh should be doing and could be doing, uh, we can't even get this study back from the city manager. So we're really hoping uh, that the council can take up this resolution and just simply get us back information about what's happening with the study. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Mahela Take Mark followed by Sheila Foreman. Good evening. Um, my name is Mihaela, and I'm here to support the nuclear weapons divestment. Uh, I moved to, to, uh, to Cambridge in 2009 uh, to study at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I instantly fell in love with the city. The city is a city that is so uh, mindful of social justice issues. It's a city that is so devoted to education and to progressive thinking. And this evening, I think I have yet another reason to fall in love again with, with Cambridge. And kudos to you for considering uh, divesting from nuclear weapons. Um, you will set an example to a lot of communities out there, um, and um, I hope that everyone will, will vote in favor this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Sheila Foreman? We'll come back to her. Amy Grunder. Hello. <laughs> Amy Gunder? Yeah. Oh, Walked in. I didn't sorry know about you that. Disappeared. Okay. <laughs> I know I did disappear. Um, good afternoon, everyone, Honorable Mayor Simmons and members of the City Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment today in support of Policy Order 7. Uh, proposed by Councillor Mason. This is concerning the election of a non-voting member to the City Council. I've been a Cambridge resident. Uh, my name is Amy Grunder. I live in Cambridge. I've lived here since 2003. Um, but I'm offering these comments on behalf of the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, uh, which where I'm Director of Legislative Affairs. And the Mayor Coalition has over 130 organizations statewide as members, including Cambridge organizations 
like the Massachusetts Alliance of Portuguese Speakers, the Community Learning Center, and others. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's been said. I don't want to, I want to limit my comments here. Um, as you're probably already aware, uh, fully a quarter of Cambridge residents are foreign born compared to about 15% of residents statewide. And about 60% of these residents lack US citizenship. And because only citizens can vote, these residents lack direct input into the deliber deliberations of city government. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick picture of who some of these people are um, who would benefit, aside from, of course, the city council itself, which would benefit from the full airing of, of issues impacting the immigrant community. So the first group is U.S. citizen children with foreign-born parents. Almost a third of children in Massachusetts are the children of immigrants, and many of these children are U.S. citizens. Long-term Cambridge residents having an immigration status which does not lead to a green card or to U.S. citizenship. Such residents don't just include, by the way, um, it's worth saying that in Massachusetts, about or TPS granted to protect people from natural disaster or armed conflict in their home countries, including, for example, Haitian earthquake survivors and others. Many people who have or are eligible for deferred action for childhood arrival status or DACA. Um, is that it? <laughs> is yes. that my bell? Yes. Okay, I'll just but I'll just anything, say anything that you have written, Amy. Yes, I'll, I'll if hand you could it. Just in. put it in the basket. Okay. Thank you so Great. very much. Great. Thank you very much. John Robbins, followed by Valerie Von Pon. Hi, thank you very much for having me. My name is John Robbins, and I'm a resident of Back Bay. And thank you again for your time, for all the excellent speakers who have gone so far on the same issue. I'll be speaking similarly on, um, on non-residents having a, an advisory role within the city council. And I'm speaking in my capacity today as the executive director of the Massachusetts chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations. We're the largest advocacy group for Muslims in the U.S. and the largest civil rights organization operating on their behalf as well. Now, as such in that role, it means I speak daily to a lot of people who are on the road to citizenship. And it is a long road, as we've heard, anywhere from five to sometimes 22 years, sometimes even longer. There are certainly individuals with whom we've interacted who have been their entire lives waiting and waiting and waiting for this. And what they most of all want, and what I'm here to really speak today, is a voice. They want a voice in participation, but they also want a voice simply of having their concerns within a venue in which it has a legitimacy. And that means within the city council chambers, that means within the ear of elected officials, not just as people who are um, regarded as second-class citizens, not simply those who are seen as um, dispensable because they, for example, may not um, be, you know, be perceived as voting members of the organization or the society. But to have these individuals feel fully fledged, to have them feel as though they are fully vested members of the civic society, a first step is, organ is, um, is policy orders such as number seven, which grant them, again, an advisory non-voting role um, as a step toward what we hope later will become, you know, greater civic participation for these groups. And this is especially a timely issue among the Muslims uh, within the area, considering that Syrian refugees will likely be coming in within the next 12 to 18 months in larger numbers, specifically throughout the greater Boston area and likely in Cambridge as well. So in anticipation of that, so that when these individuals arrive at our doors, we're not then scrambling to have representation for them, I would urge the council to adopt measures such as this to grant them a more full voice. Thank you again, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for your testimony. Valerie, followed by David Miller. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Valerie Vandepan. I'm the Director of Communications at Mira Coalition. I'm just going to pick up where Amy Grunder left off. I'm also a Cambridge resident. I lived at, live at 66 Fayette Street. We know that it can take as long as 20 years for new immigrants to fully participate in the civic lives of their communities. Barriers to participation are linguistic, cultural, economic, and political. In our view, Policy Order 7 would address several of these barriers by providing a crucial link between immigrant communities and local government, as well as a forum to explore issues impacting the immigrant community in Cambridge. 
Because immigrants are more likely than other residents to have inflexible work schedules and limited access to child care, not to mention linguistic and cultural barriers to presenting in an English language public forum, their ability to provide public comments at a city council hearing is limited. Giving residents access to local government through a member of their own communities would also provide the city with critical information about this key demographic, which increasingly includes U.S. citizen children. In, in addition to the people that Amy mentioned earlier, people who have fled um, extreme violence and natural disasters in their home countries to find safe haven here, who still are not citizens, such as those receiving temporary protected status, there are also long-term Cambridge residents who are working toward lawful permanent resident status, which is a green card. These non-citizen residents may have or be applicants for a variety of immigration statuses, most of which include work authorization. They are working often more than one job, and they are paying taxes. These include people fleeing persecution and domestic violence survivors seeking protection under the Violence Against Women Act whose cases often take years to adjudicate. Once they are granted a status, they become eligible to apply for permanent residence, which is a green card, after a prescribed waiting time, waiting period, depending on the status, which can last as long as 10 years. People with permanent resident status, green cards, who are eligible for citizenship, but lack access to services to support their application process. People granted a green card are eligible to naturalize, become U.S. citizens, after three to five years. There are about 300,000 Massachusetts residents who are eligible to become U.S. citizens. To qualify for citizenship, applicants must pass an English proficiency, proficiency and civics exam and pay a fee of $680 unless they qualify for a fee waiver. There are citizenship assistance programs that provide English and civics classes as well as applications assistance, but even with this support, the applications process can take as long as a year, a Ms. significant commitment for Ms. someone Van working Pan. one or two jobs. Thank you very much for your Thank attention. You for I your appreciate testimony. it. Thank you. David Miller. Daniel Miller, yes. It's Daniel Miller. It's David without my glasses. No problem. Um, so my name is Daniel Miller. I've lived in Cambridge for six years, and I'm a graduate researcher in the physics department at MIT. Um, I've spent over four years working on my doctoral research at the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center. So I've gained a full understanding from a scientific perspective of the destructive potential of nuclear weapons. Put simply, nuclear weapons represent a clear existential risk. Furthermore, our current overly bloated arsenal of nuclear weapons is unnecessary from a national security standpoint, and in fact presents a national, national security threat. I applaud the Council's prior stances against nuclear proliferation, and I fully support and very much hope the Council will vote in favor of the City of Cambridge divesting from nuclear weapons manufacturers. As Professor Tegmark stated, the, analytic, the analytics of financial divestment are straightforward. Only the will to do so is needed. Cambridge has the opportunity to be a leader and a powerful example for other municipal municipalities to follow in nuclear divestment. So I hope you do so. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Carol O'Hare, followed by Rocky Genti. Not here. My name is Carol O'Hare, 172 Magazine Street. I'm speaking um, in favor of uh, the lobbying disclosure, uh, Policy Order 3. How great to have Cambridge follow the lead of many municipalities throughout the country and maybe even outpace Boston. Why ever not? Shouldn't the public be able to find out which lobbyists have access to upper-level 
city administrators and honchos in the various departments who negotiate contracts, not to mention city councilors who obviously have significant power to amend our ordinances, as in MIT's 26-acre PUD, Normandy Twining, MXD, Barrett, Sage, Volpe, not to mention the adopted, later rescinded building identification sign, aka Microsoft Amendment, and the plastic bag ban, and to approve budgets. I realize that lobbyists can often, and do often, educate and provide relevant information and data to their target audiences, but of course, they're there to persuade for the benefit of those who hire and contract them for their services. And if disclosure laws provide a benefit at the federal and state levels, why not at the local level as well? Well, um, that was the sublime. This is the ridiculous. Um, this is agenda, city manager agenda number eight about A-frame signs. From from long and exceedingly tedious experience, I can say without hesitation that it is obvious that too many, too, too many, that city's entire instruction application approval process for signs in the public way is an embarrassment. It is inadequate, inconsistent, and a hodgepodge. I hope this report on your agenda will generate a concerted effort to fix this broken system, including the bare bones requirements instructions forms. For example, the um, regulations and ordinance pertaining to signs in the public way is one paragraph long. The ordinance pertaining to uh, standardizing the placement and maintenance of news racks is seven pages long. I'd say that virtually everyone would agree that news racks provide a much greater public servants, service than do bank and other commercial signs that increasingly physically and visually clutter our public sidewalks. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. O'Hare. And here is Capital One's one page Thank you, Ms. O'Hare. application. Christy Dennis, followed by Abel Carver. Christy Dennis. I'm Christy Dennis. Uh, I live at 983 Memorial Drive. Um, I urge you to recommend divestment from uh, nuclear weapons manufacturers for the retirement, Cambridge Retirement Fund, and these are my reasons. The U.S. has, U.S. promised in 1969 when it signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty to uh, work to eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, along with the Russians, we have decreased our uh, weapons, but we still have uh, between seven and 8,000, and they are much more powerful than the original weapons. Um, we, have, we have armed uh, nuclear submarines, each of 14 of them, each of which has the blast power to, uh, to destroy a continent. Since 1945, we have um, spent four trillion trillion dollars on nuclear weapons, and we are now proposing, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, one million uh, to upgrade the weapons that we have instead of uh, abiding by our treaty. Um, I just want to remind you of what a trillion dollars is. I've presented this to the, this group before. If you take a hand, the broad side of a hand, um, to, representing 14 inches, uh, four inches, uh, and put it on a graph, beside it, to represent one trillion dollars in comparison, you would need a graph 79 miles high. That would be about, uh, 15 Mount Everests, one piled on top of the other. Um, 
this is uh, an enormous amount of money that we are wasting. Most of these weapons that we built with this $4 million, uh, $4 trillion uh, have been uh, uh, defused and, and put in storage. Um, this is a valuable resource, this money, which is being spent on this, which could be used for human needs and infrastructure badly needed. Um, and we, we are spending it on dangerous, immoral, uh, and uh, driven by a, a war machine, the weapons industry. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Dennis. Sheila Foreman. Okay. Abel Carver. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, hearing this resolution. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm a senior at Harvard College. My name is Abel Corver, and uh, I'll speak in favor of uh, nuclear divestment resolution, uh, which I thank you for considering. Is, is this better? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I've been very pleased uh, um, that Cambridge has been a leader um, in working towards a sustainable future, especially on the issue of environmental sustainability through things like the Cambridge Compact for a Sustainable Future and related resolutions that were uh, adopted um, over um, previous years. Um, I'd like to thank previous speakers and second their uh, arguments for this resolution. I'd uh, like to add here that um, I think our current nuclear weapons policy is evidence of a uh, failure to educate the public and absence of a um, national conversation about uh, what it means to have a secure nuclear policy. Um, as for example, many people uh, don't think the nuclear threat exists anymore. Many citizens underestimate our number of nuclear weapons by several orders of magnitude, and some even think uh, they no longer exist. Um, so, um, and as other people have argued, the fact that we're spending a trillion dollars over the next 30 years, uh, I think, you know, clearly indicates that this is a very urgent issue. So um, I would like to propose uh, here that um, divestment is one very important step towards both raising awareness um, for this issue here in Cambridge, but also starting a national conversation, which um, has unfortunately not been started um, by our national leaders. So I think this is really an example where local government um, can um, really contribute towards a conversation about uh, foreign policy um, in, a, in a very meaningful way. And I'd also like to add to what's previously been said that um, I think, unfortunately, the nuclear modernization program has been mischaracterized to the American public, and actually a, a lot of the trillion dollars is not going towards securing the nuclear facilities or, or making, um, um, making the entire process more safe, but is instead um, focused on making them more, more um, usable in an actual war. That is, um, we would be able to destroy um, targets we weren't previously able to destroy, which, um, which of course, very much worries other countries um, because it increases the likelihood that future governments uh, might actually use these weapons, and it invites other countries um, to also uh, develop these more sophisticated uh, weapons. So I'd like to propose that divestment is a key opportunity to start a conversation about um, what kind of investment we want in our foreign policy and um, if we want to invest in um, you know, our nuclear arsenal, where in, the, where in that arsenal we want that money to go, for example, in actually securing them and, and in safely um, reducing the number rather than um, making the arsenal more sophisticated. And lastly, I would just add to what's previously been said, and a lot of the trillion dollars which goes into these uh, financial, uh, goes into these nuclear weapon producers is actually uh, illegally or semi legally uh, funneled back into political lobbying, um, which is actually, um, which also adds to this miseducation. Um, so um, I thank you for, um, I thank you for uh, considering this resolution and um, I think Cambridge can be a leader in this fund. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And Ann Dugan, followed by Jonathan King. Hello, my name is Ann Duggan and I live at 41 Gibson Street. I'm speaking on the curb cut application for my property at 41 Gibson, which is currently up for reconsideration. Um, I've already come in front of this committee and spoken, I think, twice now, and so I don't have too much to say. I, I'm just unclear on you know, how this is up for reconsideration given there is 
no new information. I would like to remind the committee that this curb cut has been approved by all four departments um, within the, the city government that it must go through and there are no current violations against it and it meets all of the requirements so it's a complying driveway. Um, I'd ask that the city council members would vote to not reconsider this item and uh, put it to rest. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Jonathan King. Followed by Rocky Genty. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'm Jonathan King from 40 Essex Street. Uh, the U.S. currently maintains thousands of nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. Um, as Christy Dennis has just noted, the missiles fired from just one of our 14 Ohio-class nuclear submarines with their multiple independently targeted warheads can obliterate every major city of any country on Earth. And as yet, as you have also just heard, our administration is proposing to spend more than a trillion dollars, a thousand billion of our tax dollars for nuclear weapons upgrade contracts over the next 30 years. This includes building eight more nuclear submarines in addition to the 14 we already have. Now, all of us have been told for since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that these amoral weapons of mass destruction are deployed to protect us, justifying the enormous expenditures of tax dollars. Did they protect the people in Manhattan's Twin Towers? No. Did they protect anyone from ISIS or the Taliban or Al-Qaeda? No. Have our thousands of nuclear weapons or Chinas or Russians prevented the North Koreans from going ahead with their own nuclear weapons? No. Did they solve our health care, education, transportation, or energy problems? No. Right? They do not. Uh, increase national security. They decrease national security. Now, we were brought up to believe that this nuclear deterrence and our national security depended on giving contracts to companies like Lockheed Martin to develop these, these missiles and for their manufacture and maintenance. The reality is at the present time, may have been the case 40 years ago, but right now it's just the opposite. Some, a substantial amount of the super profits that companies like Lockheed Martin and others derive from nuclear weapons contracts are used to finance the election of congresspersons and related security authorities who promote the fallacious notion that the weapons are needed for our national security. It's an enormous scam at the kind of global, uh, global level. The Berlin Wall came down 25 years ago. Neither the Chinese nor the Russian nor the Mexicans have armies on our borders ready to invade. Um, now, let me close with reminding you that many of the national reform movements in the U.S., from abolition to women's suffrage to voting rights for African Americans, they weren't initiated from on high, but began in local communities. Thirty-five years ago, the nuclear weapons freeze campaign started here in Cambridge. Eventually, it achieved sufficient impact that Ronald Reagan himself, leading Hawk, was forced to negotiate with Mikhail Gorbachev to start reducing the nuclear weapons arsenals, and significant reductions were achieved. Unfortunately, this very wise diplomatic initiative has been allowed to erode away. You know, for our children and our planet, we have to revive it. Let's begin right here tonight by passing policy order number one. Thank you for your time. Richard Krishnik, followed by Patricia, I'm not sure the last name, at 41 Pleasant Street. I uh, had uh, submitted to the counselors, and you've received the uh, article on nuclear weapons that uh, Jonathan and I had recently co-authored. I hope you had a chance to look at it. I, I wanted to mention that a former city council member uh, from this chamber, David Wiley, many years ago, who I think was instrumental in uh, getting Cambridge to, uh, I forget the exact thing, but so that nuclear materials couldn't be transported through the city. Well, uh, Dave, uh, Dave is a former colleague of mine from my community development years in Boston, uh, one of my legal eagles, and uh, um, 
uh, he, uh, I think about five years ago, his, he kept his interest uh, in the issue, and I don't know if any of you have seen it, but five years ago he published a book, City Save Thyself, in which he presents the argument that we cannot rely on the federal government or state governments to resolve this issue for us. It's only at the municipal level that public action uh, can create the crescendo effect uh, to affect these nuclear weapons issues at the national level. Anyway, he, he devoted an entire book to making the argument that what you do here tonight is what is really important <laughs> on this issue. Uh, Anyway, I just wanted to emphasize what I think is the most important thing to keep in mind right now, uh, which uh, you spoke to, I believe it was, uh, <laughs> about the increased accuracy of this new generation of nuclear weapons that's being developed. You know, we used to have these 400 megaton weapons, uh, which are many hundred times more powerful, you know, than Hiroshima-sized weapons and so on. Their purpose was to take out Soviet missile silos because they were so inaccurate, you know, that you'd have to have a blast so huge that it would obliterate a significant portion of New York City in order to know that you took out an underground missile silo. This new generation of nuclear weapons is going to have dialable warheads, so you can dial the size of the blast from 0.3 megatons to 50 megatons. And now they're so, they're so accurate. Instead of hundreds of meters, they're going to be accurate to within 10 meters. So you need a much smaller blast, uh, just a few times the Hiroshima size, uh, to know that you can take out a missile silo. And, of course, you have far less collateral damage. So it becomes much, much more attractive to military people involved in this kind of military, strategic, and tactical thinking to use these Mr. weapons, Mr. Krishnick, thinking they can get away with it Mr. without causing a nuclear war. Minutes. I want to thank, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we have now Patricia of 41 Pleasant Street. Pat, oh, Patrick, you need to take penmanship, honey. <laughs> hello, my name, hello, my name is Patricia Barrett. I will be living at 41 Pleasant Street shortly. Um, I came here, and I just assumed everyone else came here to talk about the sidewalks in Central Square. Um, but I'm starting to see why we're not talking about the sidewalks in Central Square. In 1987, there was an action plan that was adopted by a council um, that recognized that the vaults underneath the ground in Central Square were the largest impediment to improving the streetscape in Central Square. Fast forward to 2013 when the C2 report came out. It also enumerated the vaults under the sidewalks in Central Square as being the largest impediment to improving the streetscape. How can we fix the sidewalks when we're ending nuclear war, we're trying to figure out how to get a foreign-born citizen on the council, um, and resolve the $15 an hour issue. I can see why these things haven't been done. Um, I'm just asking uh, this council to think a little bit more pragmatically and give me a shining ray of hope that we can fix the sidewalks in Central Square 30 years later um, by addressing these vaults. It's not a difficult task to do. It's extremely expensive to fix, but it's been put on the backs of the property owners to do it. There's very simple ways of creating a bond system or doing outreach to individual property owners to see what mechanisms we can do to help them finance the removal of these vaults, but the Central Square streetscape needs fixing badly. Um, you could also go ahead and adopt recommendations in C2 and give people, the property owners, the ability to re-envision their properties and then afford to be able to fix the vaults themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick Barrett. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jerry Zurif, followed by Genevieve Wagnett. Gerald Zorif, uh, 120 Foster Street, been a Cambridge resident for more than 50 years. Um, the proposed curb cut on Gibson Street will put a driveway that will end just a few feet from our backyard, yet we were not surveyed by the city. Um, I'm not sure why, but I want to officially register my objection to the curb cut. I understand that on 
I have one set of neighbors for whom this driveway would be a convenience for getting in and out of their homes, but I hope the council will not let that convenience outweigh the health risks to my other set of neighbors who will have a car along with noise and fumes within feet of their windows and vents, and they have two small children and a third on the way. Given the ambiguity about the measurements of the driveway and the regulations, I hope that the council will recommend a compromise. One possible compromise would be to have the driveway in the backyard coming off Kenway because there was a historical driveway at, there, at that point at one time, and I think that should be reinstituted. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Janet, Genevieve Wagonet, followed by Ted Wagonet. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Genevieve Wagonacht. I live at 43 Gibson Street. I'm an immediate abutter to 41 Gibson uh, and speaking about the proposal on their curb cut. I, I want to thank the City Council for hearing this matter again. Many of you know my husband, Ted, and I believe the current zoning ordinance 6.44.1 does not permit a driveway or parking space to be within 10 feet of a habitable room unless it is the actual homeowner who wishes to have parking in close distance to their own home. Given the entire section of 6.40 was written to, quote, protect the health, safety, and welfare of the users of the parking and abutting properties, it defies logic that this clause can even be read any other way. We've also tried to communicate to you our concerns that you are making a decision based on inconsistent information. One set of plans presented shows obstacles that will prevent the ability to have a car pull fully into the space. Another set of plans conveniently leaves those obstacles off to show they can conform. But even that inconsistency doesn't sway some of you. Instead, I'd like to focus my comments on the concept that just because somebody can do something doesn't mean it's right or fair. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have negative consequences. I'll give you some examples. I could stop recycling, but I know it's bad for the planet and our community. I could throw batteries in the trash or pour paint down my drains, but I worry about ground and water contamination. I could run the lawnmower at 7 a.m. on a Sunday, paint my house a garish color, play loud music outside, let my garden go to seed. But I know all of these would anger my neighbors and cause concern over the negligence that I would show towards my property. These are examples of actions that I technically can do. There's nothing stopping me, but I know they are not right, they are not fair, and so I don't do them. They have measurable negative impact on others. It is now your turn to reflect on the same principle. Several of you believe they can put a driveway there, and so they should be able to, regardless of the negative impact it has on neighbors in the community. I find this to be a dangerous sentiment for elected leaders to espouse. And I'd like to remind you there is a negative impact associated with your decision. First, there's an impact to me and my family's health and well-being with a car parked so close to our home. There's negative impact to our property values. Neither our home nor theirs was cited with the mind of putting an asphalt driveway right between them. And lastly, because our neighborhood will lose two valuable parking spaces. What is even more frustrating is there's a suitable alternative location on the property for this parking. It satisfies everyone's reading of the zoning, yours and ours. It would be the same location as was the driveway for the previous homeowner, and it does not reduce the overall parking in the neighborhood. If you vote in favor of this proposal, you are sending a clear signal to our community that regardless of the impact of one's actions, just because somebody can do something, well, then you might as well go ahead. And that has the potential to be a very negative force in this community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Teg Wagonet, followed by Rocky Genti. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and City Councilors. Uh, my name is Ted Wagonet, and I live at 43 Gibson Street. And I am speaking today uh, about application 2016 number 10, the curb cut application at 41 Gibson. The proposed a site of the parking spot as a result of this curb cut application violates ordinance 6.44.1A of the code. There can be no misinterpretation of this ordinance. It is clear that an open parking space on grade cannot be within 10 feet of habitable windows of abutting properties. This has been communicated both to the council in my last appearance and to inspectional services. Yet somehow the focus here has been placed on determining the width of the proposed site and not on the fact that not only will the proposed parking spot be right on the plane of 41 Gibson Street wall or their wall and dangerously close to their own windows, but also five feet from my habitable and occupiable windows. 
No substantive debate of this portion of the ordinance has been had by the council, and I'm not aware of any substantive findings or reports by inspectional services that this ordinance would allow such a parking spot. I believe that this should be your focus tonight. It is quite clear that inspectional services is misinterpreting or ignoring the ordinance to the detriment of the neighborhood, and I ask that the city council stop this. As evidence of the ordinance's proper interpretation, I sent a PDF to each of you individually that reviews all of the homes in the neighborhood with parking spaces. Every single home except for one has parking spaces that are 10 feet or more away from neighboring habitable windows. The one exception is 6 Kenway, a home with no other location option. Note here, please, that in this case, the applicant has another location option that does not violate any ordinances. But let's forget ordinances, set them aside, and talk about the important things here. There is a win-win location on this site where everyone gets some of what they want, the Kenway side of the house. How can the council approve something that will impact the health of my family, of human beings, when there is an alternative on the same site that does no such thing? Uh, there is another site that is not near any windows, located in the back of the property. Now, if this vote passes, of course, we will appeal this to the ZBA. But the council can and should prevent that waste of time, that waste of resources, by voting this proposal down as is and suggesting a Kenway location. This is a question of my family's health and well-being, and I would like you or to ask you to please interpret this ordinance correctly and reject this application. I've included three copies of this PDF, one for each group of you, showing uh, that all of the houses and the distances to and from their parking spots are greater than 10 feet from occupiable or habitable windows. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Rocky Genti, followed by David Thoreau. Thoreau. So, I'm here to represent uh, the Haitian communities, uh, not only the Haitian communities and other communities who doesn't have no voice in Cambridge. Uh, the reason I'm here uh, is very simple. Uh, there is some communities who live in Cambridge for almost 30 years, 20 years. Uh, they, never have, uh, they never have any voice in any election in Cambridge. And they don't even know who is representing them. Uh, well, we have a petition, just me and, uh, and Mrs. Oliveira. Okay, she's right there. So, okay, so we put forward. For any, anybody who lives in Cambridge, who is resident in Cambridge, who pay their taxes in Cambridge, there should, okay, there should be a vote to vote in any election in Cambridge. So I don't want you guys to be understood about someone to be citizen. I said legal residence. It's plain and simple. If, if, if they have something, maybe they, okay, they know where to go. But right now, there's so many of them. So then, okay, they even know who is representing them. So I'm here today for them. They want to have no voice. They want to okay, doesn't speak in English, but they live in Cambridge. They pay their taxes. They do everything in Cambridge. So, okay, that's why I'm here today. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is David Thoreau, followed by Susan Ringel, Ringer or Ringler. Hi, I'm David Thoreau, a Ringler. grad student here at MIT. I live at 16 Bristol Street here in Cambridge. I just want to express my support for um, uh, item number one on the list uh, to divest from uh, nuclear weapon industry. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Susan Ringler, followed by Heather Hoffman. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Ringler. I live at 82 Canard Street in Cambridge. Um, I'd like to make a couple of different comments here. First, I would like to um, support policy order number one. I think it's a great idea to divest um, from controversial things. It looks like it's pretty easy to do, and it would um, 
there's lots of other ways for the pension funds to earn money. I just think it would be a great thing and, and would show um, Cambridge as a forward-looking and, um, and progressive city that it is. I'd also like to speak in favor of policy order number seven. I think having a non-citizen representative is also a terrific idea. Um, we have a very diverse and interesting city, and um, I think this would be a way to engage parts of our community that uh, we're not um, – terribly engaged with, and I, I, again, I think this, it's a terrific idea. I'd also like um, to speak today about number 16.6 on the agenda, the tool library. I realize this is a somewhat different order of magnitude than the other two. Um, but I, you know, I like the idea of a tool library, I, a lending library. I'm a member of the Somerville tool library. Um, I'm not sure that we have to do it in quite the way that it's kind of looking at here. Um, I, I don't know that a full-time staff person is required. I we might end up with more of a seasonal situation than um, a 12-month-a-year thing. I also don't think we need to buy $60,000 of new tools. I think that uh, we could look for donations uh, from some things. I think that we can also start small. I don't think we have to have drill presses to begin with. Um, and I think um, we might be able to get some retired uh, tools from maybe the DPW. Maybe they can get some new shovels and we can get some old shovels um, or some other kinds of ways to do that. So I, I, I just would like to encourage you with the idea, but maybe there's some other ways of looking at it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Heather Hoffman, followed by Parnell Schuler. Hello, Heather Hoffman, 213 Hurley Street. And first I'd like to talk about the um, policy order that was charter-righted, having to do with planning applications. Um, I would repeat what I said last week and also add what Carol O'Hare put in her excellent email on the subject. Um, I think that transparency and access to knowledge about any matters that are before the city government are good for our democracy. And um, then I, I wanted to express my absolute delight over the uh, resolution on Tom Lehrer. Um, <laughs> Well, my, when my mother still lived in Cambridge, she was friends with Tom Lehrer, and I have um, my one of my most prized possessions is a copy of that self-pressed album um, and inscribed to her, and I can tell you that Tom Lehrer has beautiful handwriting. Um, and uh, I would, with respect to one of the big topics tonight, I would commend to you his thoughts on the bomb. <laughs> Now, with respect to the bomb, um, back 20-odd years ago, I was on the board of directors of INFACT. That was during the nuclear weapon makers campaign, and I was, I was there at a really pivotal time. Um, I, was, I was there when uh, a film that we, uh, that we funded, Deadly Deception, um, about General Electric and the nuclear weapons industry won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. And I was there when we declared victory and GE pulled out of the business. So social acceptability is incredibly important to changing anything. And this is a piece of changing the social acceptability. Right now, we have seen in our own lives, so many examples of that. One um, very important one is looking at marriage as not mattering with who, who has what gender. And then another one has to do with the um, current presidential campaign, uh, which has made social acceptability a really important topic in good and bad ways. Um, and with respect to... Um, a non-voting member who's not a citizen of the, um, being on the city council, I would point you to an example that we have in the city right now, and that is the student members of the school committee. Um, now, admittedly, they, they don't do quite as much as this is proposed, but we can also look at the, um, the U.S. House and the non-voting representative from the District of Columbia, for example. It's an important thing, and it would enrich your discussions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Sheila Foreman. Followed by Parvel Shaikov. Thank you very much uh, for 
for calling me again. I want to thank Mayor Simmons and all of you for allowing this uh, resolution to come, this item to come before you again tonight. Uh, having worked on nuclear ab abolition, the uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons for many years, and in fact have been here when we agreed in on this uh, this committee agreed to put a question on the ballot back in 1999, and it was on the ballot asking for uh, then President Clinton to call for uh, an international meeting to get rid of nuclear weapons. At that, so at that end, that passed by, I believe, I could not find the statistics, but more than 60 percent of of Cambridge residents voted in favor of that. Again, we tried to put something on in 2009, and it turned out that it was going to cost between $30,000 and $35,000 just to mail information about the ballot to all the members of of Cam all the, the residents of Cambridge, and it was considered by the city manager to be uh, too much to spend. However, I'm wondering right now whether that amount, and I could not find that out, is, is less than the amount of money that we're spending to support nuclear weapons. At that time, the city council agreed that it was sufficient to just come out against having nuclear weapons and in favor of getting rid of our nuclear weapons. It was at that time, once again, that Mayor Simmons put the, brought this before the council. So I think it's clear that the people of Cambridge do, would be unhappy to think that we have investments in, uh, in nuclear weapons, which we do. Lockheed Martin is a, a nuclear weapons maker who you've probably heard from a number of other people, makes uh, Trident submarines, not only for us, but for the UK and other, uh, and maintains other weapons as well. So I just want to um, reinforce what other members of our group have said, other people have said this evening. I hope that you will agree that we should divest of this uh, we should get rid of this investment. Thank you very much. And it's not the way your, Cambridge wants to go. And thank you for your testimony. Pravel Shivkov. Marilyn Wellens. Followed by Hassan Rashid. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My name is Marilyn Wellens. I live at 651 Green Street. And I'm following a large number of people who have spoken very, very well about a large number of very important topics. And I, um, I second, in particular, Carol O'Hare's points about um, both uh, policy order number three, uh, the lobbying disclosure. Um, it seems relatively innocuous to me. I don't know that anybody who's an elected official or an appointed official in the city of Cambridge would have problems with it, but I, I'm not that familiar. And again, I would like to encourage uh, you to um, encourage the city to enforce laws against visual clutter and also uh, when the time comes to vote in favor of proper regulation of, of light. Um, but I'd like to go back to the planning documents that I believe have been submitted to you, and I will play my standard tune which um, having thanked um, Councillor Toomey for the policy order about Tom Lehrer and, and other um, policy orders. Um, the planning documents before you submitted by the manager talk about uh, protecting natural resources, the heat island, flooding, planning for the future, uh, and again, um, introduce green in infrastructure elements where possible to reduce impervious uh, surfaces and introduce natural systems. I'm still on the tree issue, uh, and I'm still, I'm still taken with the idea that so-called greenways uh, in the way uh, where trees are in the way of so-called greenways, the green trees are replaced by 
the things the color of asphalt. And I think that this is a misguided understanding of what the environment is all about and what we're actually facing with climate change. I grew up under the shadow of nuclear weapons, and I have been concerned with them all my life. And now uh, my uh, particular concern is another form of doom, which has to be climate change and what will happen to the world that my daughter and uh, any uh, grandchildren will live in and our other, our other progeny. So, so again, I really would like to see the council take seriously the idea of protecting and preserving the urban canopy, taking seriously the services that so-called non-native invasives provide to the city. And I guess in closing, I'd like to point out that I recently learned that ginkgo trees, um, one to two kilometers from ground zero at Hiroshima, survived the blast and are part of the, um, of Thank the you memorial for, there. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hassan Rashid, followed by John Ratliff. Peace be unto you. Hello, everybody. I'm Hassan Rashid. I reside at 820 Massachusetts Avenue. My public comment is on hearing schedule, unfinished business uh, item four, communications item two, policy order resolution list uh, item seven eight. At my last uh, public comment. Mr. Rashid, I, you can speak on everything except for what's on the communications list. So. Oh, that's. Everything but what's on the communication. I have, I have, I have a communi I, I, an item there. You speak on the communication. I can't speak list. on that. No. Okay. Uh, at my last public comment, I stated that Christopher Columbus was a man of color. Well, since that time, uh, I have uncovered information that lay claim of Columbus being born in Genoa. I, last time I said Palermo, and his birth record is located in Genoa. The, and that DNA an analysis of his remains done by forensic scientists at the University of Cambridge revealed that he was 100% of color. A homeless trust fund and task force is an alternate evidence-based human service strategy and method to be applied towards ending homelessness. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25, 1, everyone has a right to, to a standard of living adequate for health and well being. Homelessness reflects a statewide local housing crisis deficit and gap and has led to a public health crisis. Several weeks ago at the State House, I joined in on calling Massachusetts lawmakers to declare a state emergency to end homelessness, taking immediate action to help stop the crisis. It's self evident that a well being index is unnecessary when it comes to measuring or analyzing homelessness. The recent triple A Cambridge bond rating is also self-evident. Therefore, the use of uh, a wellness index is questionable. There's an agenda item today that speaks of non-citizen representatives to city council. What about a homeless citizen liaison? I thought that type of work was uh, designated out to an ecumenical assembly of local chaplains, all of them Christians, truly not representative of or reflecting Cambridge's ethnic diversity, etc. What about a homeless citizen liaison? During the upcoming city council roundtable working meeting with the school committee, I would like to see uh, conversations and discussions included that will reflect on ideals relating to piloting a new curriculum that explores the link between homelessness and poverty. This should also be included in upcoming debates herein or about charter and public schools here in Cambridge. Finally, I would like to see the altern alternative human human strategies, human service strategies that I have been uh, commenting on, considered for and included as a budget priority two for, uh, two for the upcoming fiscal years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rashid. John Ratliff. Madam Mayor and members of the council, I also am here to speak in support of the policy order recommending that we disinvest in nuclear weapons. I think it's another step along an important road that Cambridge has been following for some time, as was alluded to earlier in the comments by Sheila Foreman and Heather. There's been a history here of trying to do something, of trying to be a leader in this important area um, where the world faces 
obliteration unless we act. It's almost inevitable that these thousands of weapons will one day be used or some portion of them, and it doesn't take many to really destroy the world. So inaction is really contributing to the doom of all of us. And I think Cambridge can play an important role by sort of stepping up the action, by doing something where we have some skin in the game in the terms of our own investments, making it real, our earlier commitments to mayors for peace, to the nuclear, anti-nuclear movement, to Hiroshima. Um, and in response to something one of my uh, fellow Cantabrigians said earlier, um, it is important that we pay attention to the sidewalks and the ambience of Cambridge. Um, but I think it's also very important that we pay due uh, attention to the money our citizens earn, to the representation our residents from other countries who are living here and building our community have in our governing body, and to matters of life and death, such as the environment and the nuclear threat we all face. Um, one nuclear bomb could really wreak havoc to the sidewalks of Central Square. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. That concludes public comment. Pleasure of the City Council. On a motion by Councilor Kelly to end public comment, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Public comment is now closed. I would like to beg my colleagues' indulgence. I know there are a number of people that came out to hear um, to see the outcome of policy order number one. Um, so I would like to entertain a motion uh, to suspend the rules. Motion by Vice Mayor McGovern to suspend the rules in order to take policy order number one off the policy list and out of order. So on suspension, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Policy order number one is before us. Um, pleasure of the City Council. Any comments? Vice Mayor McGovern. I have to say um, thank you to you, Madam Mayor, for, for bringing this forward, and thank you to everyone who, who came out to speak. Um, you know, this is, uh, I rarely say things are a no-brainer, but this is pretty much, if there was a no-brainer, this would be it. Um, you know, my my guess, I hope I'm wrong, but what, what I think we might hear back is some concern from the retirement board that they have a responsibility to invest in stable, you know, companies that can promote a growth and all that kind of stuff. But um, I hope that's not what we hear back. And, and I guess I just my message to them um, would be to get creative uh, and figure out a way to make this happen. And... Um, uh, I hope that uh, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope we get a response back that that, that we can move ahead and and, and do this. Uh, I certainly support it, and I think the community at large does as well. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor McGovern, Councilor Chung. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I uh, wholeheartedly support this order. I think it uh, sends a great statement and makes a lot of sense, both morally and fiscally. I will say, having worked on divestment. Uh, from fossil fuels with the retirement board previously that uh, their ability to, to do divestment is tightly controlled, I think, by state statute. And uh, what they'll probably come back with us is that we need to have some change in uh, state regulations in order to, for them to be able to do that. But uh, we won't know for sure until we send this forward. And I hope that as a city we'll be able to do it. But if not, I think I'm uh, looking forward to seeing us press even forward to the next step uh, and asking for some change at the state level so that our retirement board can reflect the values that we share as a community and how we invest. So thank you for bringing this forward, and thank you for everyone coming out tonight. Thank you, Councilor Chung. Councilor Carlin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I also greatly appreciate uh, the fact that you have promoted this policy order, um, I thought the speakers spoke eloquently and and some of the facts um, were very, very troubling, and the monetary investment is just sickening. Um, 
I, there's no question that uh, this will pass, I hope, unanimously. Um, I suspect it will. Um, I'm voting for a friend named Hiro, and he's from Japan, and he was four years old in Hiroshima the day the bomb went off and lost ten of his brothers and sisters and his father. And the only reason he survived, his mother and sister, is they were out in the country a mile and a half away on the non-bomb side of the house. And uh, he survived, and he is the most gentle person you will ever meet and has reason to not be gentle. So um, thank you for doing this. It's a wonderful move forward. Thank you, Council Carlon. Council Toomey, then Council Mazin. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you for bringing this forward, and I will be supporting it. And want to thank, I don't know who dropped off the uh, little booklet here on just the effect of a, even a limited nuclear war would have on the uh, food supplies and agriculture throughout the world and the possibility of 2 billion individuals being at risk of malnutrition and dying from that, from a, a nuclear famine. So uh, hopefully uh, this will pass unanimous and uh, we will uh, hopefully engage attention from other communities on this um, very, unfortunately, real possibility of what's going on in the world today. So uh, hopefully this small step on our behalf will uh, also uh, ignite some support from communities around the country. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Toomey. Councilor Mazin. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor, for bringing this before us. Thank you to Professor uh, Tegmark and uh, many of the others who have um, championed this issue, many for a long, long time. Um, th this particular issue is also a placeholder for a larger issue about military spending and municipal investment and, and a whole host of other things. And so I hope that in looking into this, I'm sure there's always people who say, well, let's not open up uh, public involvement and investment too far. It would set a precedent. I, I hope it does open up and I hope it does set a precedent. I hope that we as a community and I hope that our universities along with us look very carefully about what types of things can draw what return, how consistently, because there's a lot of things that can draw a return. And frankly, uh, if we can't afford something because uh, uh, a weapon of mass destruction um, is no longer on our investment uh, roster, then so be it. I, I think those are choices that society will have to come to sooner or later, and, and, and uh, by gosh, it should have been <clears throat> a lot sooner. Um, in terms of sidewalks, I just a uh, prior comment, as if we couldn't be um, doing both at the same time, I, I really hope that <clears throat> people don't consider um, starting national movements on the local level as a distraction from municipal responsibilities because, in fact, it will be Cambridge and it will be cities like Cambridge that uh, take these struggles to the federal level. But, in fact, all, all of that will start in, in cities like Cambridge and in bodies like this. So I, I'm just super appreciative that this is happening, and, and I also hope that the organizers will, will hold us responsible when it comes time to march up the next level or two um, at the State House or in Washington. Thanks. Thank you, Council Mazin. For the discussion? Uh, I want to just uh, acknowledge and thank Lucas Perry and Professor Max Pegmark for coming in to bring this to my attention and to our attention. Uh, the, uh, you know, a, a single drop will wear a rock, and I think this is that single drop that will start to wear down um, on the issue that is so important to us. You know, Cambridge has already gone and record in opposing nuclear proliferation and divesting our retirement funds from companies that help contribute to the nuclear problem. And so this is just another step in that direction. That's, this, is, this is that additional drop. And if Cambridge as a city makes this move, it's really my hope that's going to inspire companies, other municipalities, private individuals to look at their investments and to make similar moves, which could, I believe, over time have an appreciable, appreciable and positive impact going forward for it. If there's no further discussion, I would ask uh, the clerk to call the roll. Madam Clerk. But I also want to acknowledge Mass Peace Action. I apologize for not saying that. On policy order number one, Councillor Calhoun. Yes. Councillor Chung. 
Council Devereaux. Yes. Council Kelly. Yes. Council Ma. Yes. Council Mazin. Yes. Vice Mayor McGovern. Yes. Council Toomey. Yes. Mayor Simmons. Yes. And policy order number one is adopted on the affirmative vote with eight in favor and one recorded as absent. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> we'll, we'll now move to the next item of business's reconsideration. Uh, Vice Mayor McGovern in the chair. The chair. Uh, the, um, um, okay. So a yes so, means they want to reconsider. Yes. A no vote means no, they yes. don't want to reconsider. Yes. And then it, the no vote not reconsidered means That's the action it. taken last stands. Then the next vote is to e to either um, adopt it or deny it. Okay. No, I have it. Thank this you. So this is um, just so everyone is clear, uh, we're going to uh, vote on reconsideration. I'll read uh, the order that, we're, that uh, we're talking about. If you would like to reconsider the vote, you vote yes, and then it comes up for discussion. If you do not wish to reconsider, you vote no. You got that, Councilor Kelly? I'm looking right at you. <laughs> okay. So the order in front of us is a reconsideration. Mayor Simmons filed reconsideration of the vote taken on March 14th, 2016, adopting an order for a curb cut at the premises numbered 41 Gibson Street. Discussion? Please. So bef um, before we can have any discussion, we have to vote on reconsideration, Madam Clerk. On reconsideration, Councilor Calone. No. Councilor Chung. Oh, Councilor Devereaux. No. Councilor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Ma. No. Councilor Mazin. No. Vice Mayor McGovern. No. Councilor Toomey. No. Mayor Simmons. Yes. And reconsideration fails on an affirmative vote with two in favor and seven in the negative. We now move on to the city manager's uh, agenda. Or, yes? I would move the adoption of 1 through 12. On a motion by Councillor Marr to move the adoption of 1 through 12 and bring them um, before us. All those in favor say aye. Those yeah, opposed to Can we just... Gus? Now we now now they're in front of us, so oh, okay. now we can <laughs> pleasure of the committee of the council. Either way, <laughs> whatever we are, Councillor Carlo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I'd like to pull uh, many of these for simple questions: number one, number eight, number ten, and eleven. Eight, ten, and eleven. Pleasure of the council, uh, council Councillor Devereaux. Uh, yes, I'd like to pull number, um, sorry, seven, please. Pleasure of the council. Twelve. Councillor Toomey, twelve. Do it. Roll call on remaining. Someone else. <coughs> okay, roll call on the balance. On the consent agenda items, Councillor Calone. Yes. Councillor Chung. Yes. Councillor Devereaux. Yes. Councillor Kelly. Yes. Councillor Ma. Yes. Councillor Mazin. Yes. Vice Mayor McGovern. Yes. Councillor Toomey. Yes. Mayor Simmons. And the consent agenda items are adopted on the affirmative vote with eight in favor, one recorded as absent. We now move on to number one. Of course, I'm, I forgot to bring my glasses up here. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm on TV. Can you get my hand? <laughs> Trans, uh, city manager's agenda item number one pulled by Councillor Carlone. Transmission, transmitting communication from Richard C. Rossi, city manager, relative to the transfer of $20,000 from the general fund 
electrical other ordinary maintenance account, to the general fund electrical extraordinary expenditure account, which will allow the electrical department to continue to expand the fiber optic network for public safety radios. The project is supported by savings from the electric streetlight budget. Councillor Carlo. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I don't question any.